Dr. Sally to kindly say a prayer for us. Thank you, President. Prayer. We invoke the blessing upon this meeting of goodwill everywhere. May we prove ourselves worthy citizens of our country, devoted to truth, sincere in fellowship, given to service, and confident in steadfast faith, preservers faithful to these ideals. Let us stand firm when the fight is hard. Give us strength sufficient for this day. Make us as big as our problems and to stay bigger than our responsibilities. God help us to live up to our capabilities. Amen. Amen. And now I'd like to request all of us, uh, if you have something to drink, kindly raise a glass. Alternatively, we can have the palm to the chest as we toast to the President of the Republic of Kenya. President. To the President. Thank you. And uh, now I'd like to welcome all uh, visiting Rotarians and guests. We do have some guests of Rotarians. And uh, uh, Christine and Mumbi are guests. Um, I believe they're, uh, the individuals who have welcomed them are yet to log on. But uh, welcome, Christine. Welcome, Mumbi. And uh, I'd like to uh, invite Rotarian Lorraine to kindly say a few words to us. Rotarian Lorraine. Uh, thank you once again, President Ritesh. Good afternoon, fellow Rotarians and guests. Uh, my name is Rotarian Lorraine Kirigia, uh, currently serving as a Vice President of Rotary Club of Karen, as well as a Speaker Director. And I'm very glad to be joining your meeting. I, I do try as much as I can to join your meetings because you have very interesting speakers. So thank you very much. And your President is also a very good friend of mine. Thank you, President Ritesh. Thank you, Rotary and Lorraine, most welcome. And please convey our best regards to President Anne and all members of Rotary Club of Karen. And, uh, thank you, Walter. Thank you. I see Rotary and Winnie is with us. Uh, Rotary and Winnie, would you like to introduce your guest for today? Good afternoon, fellow Rotarians. It's, it's a pleasure. Thank you, President Ritesh. And my guest is Christine. Uh, she's in hospitality and uh, she's quite keen in joining our club. Kindly let us uh, make her feel welcome. Thank you, President Ritesh. Thank you, Rotarian uh, Winnie. And uh, we also have a guest of Dr. David Gitanga. Uh, Mumbi, Mumbi, would you like to say a few words? Hi, everybody. My name is Mumbi. Um, I'm currently an entrepreneur in the manufacturing industry, primarily natural cosmetics, and I'm really honoured to be in these meetings and learning more about the Rotary Club of Nairobi. Thank you. Thank you so much, and uh, we are glad you're uh, attending our meetings, and please do keep visiting. Thank you so much. Do we have any more guests of Rotarians or visiting Rotarians? If not, um, allow me to kindly uh, introduce <clears throat> our speaker for today. Our speaker for today is Lady Justice Joyce Oluwatch. Lady Justice Joyce Oluwatch is a former judge and first vice president of the International Criminal Court at The Hague, the Netherlands. She was the second woman in Court of Appeal, High Court judge, as well as mag magistrate in Kenya. Upon retirement from the bench in 2018, she successfully moved her legal profession to alternative dispute resolution mechanisms, particularly mediation and arbitration. She's a certified international mediator, a certified advanced mediator, a chartered mediator, and an accredited mediator. She co-founded uh, Equitas Mediators and conducts uh, mediations under the Court Annexed Mediation Program in Kenya, FIDA Kenya, international and domestic mediations, and virtual mediations. She is a member of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators London and the Kenya Branch International Council for Commercial Arbitration, 
Africa Arbitration Association, and Nairobi Center for International Arbitration. She was recently appointed a member of the International Advisory Board of the Office of Ombudsman for the United Nations Fund and Programs, Chair of the Advisory Board of the Africa Asia Mediation Association, Board Member of Mediators Beyond Borders International. She's a law graduate from the University of Nairobi, an advocate for the High Court of Kenya, and holds a master's degree in international affairs from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, Tufts University, where she was honored as a distinguished alumni. And again in 2018, she received the university's top award only granted to those who have carried the university's ideal throughout their career. This made her the first person of black origin to receive such an honor she is an adjunct professor of the Faculty of Law, University of the Western Cape, South Africa. She is a recipient of several international and national awards, including presidential awards of Elder of the Burning Spear, EBS, First Class Order of the Burning Spear, CBS, and Trailblazer Awards, CBS. Now, it's a matter of pride for us as she's also a member of the Rotary Club of Nairobi and uh, has transferred to our club in membership from the Rotary Club of Hague Metropolitan. And uh, with that, I'd like all of us to kindly give a very warm round of applause as we welcome our speaker for today, our very own Rotarian Justice Joyce on Watch. Justice on Watch? Yes. Wonderful. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President, um, for that introduction. I was listening very keenly. Thank you. Can I go on? Yes, please. Good. Now, uh, fellow Rotarians, um, Mr. President and fellow Rotarians, good afternoon. Whatever I'm going to say is not totally new. Why? Because we are all living in this pandemic. So I just want to probably put a few things into focus, but I don't think it's going to be new. What I want to say is that the unprecedented threat from COVID-19 pandemic has caused great suffering, not just here, but all over the world. While first and foremost, the pandemic is a public health crisis, and there are several doctors in our club. I hope I'm right when I say that. But first and foremost is a public health crisis. It has nevertheless caused challenges in almost every sector. And the struggle to uphold the rule of law and the role of law enforcement in societies are some of the challenges that this pandemic has caused. Because if it's a public health crisis, and here I'm talking about justice, law, and um, justice law and uh, justice, the rule of law and this pandemic. Let me see if I can uh, share my screen, if, if I may share my screen. I hope I can share. Uh, wow, let's see. Let's just see. I'm trying to share my screen. I hope I will. Yes, there it is. You can see any something on my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. So I will say that I'll be talking about the rule of law because building the rule of law takes time. It takes vision and money. But it is the soundest investment that a country can have. And that's why I chose that I chose to talk about the rule of law. Let's see. The, uh, yeah, I think that's my first slide. That's just the title of what I want to talk about. Then just um, is you know is everybody knows what justice is about. But I think if we all uh, have a same a similar understanding, it will be easier. And justice is just a concept of moral rightness based on ethics, 
rationality, law, natural law, religion or equity. It, it is also the act, act of being just and fair. Now, we can never talk about uh, the rule of law without talking about uh, this gentleman, A.C. Dicey. Now, he was a professor of law at um, Oxford University. He was also a constitutional lawyer. And look at, we are talking about 1885. And the books of law, the books have him because he popularized this term, the rule of law. He's the one who popularized it. Otherwise, it had been founded in the 17th century, but he popularized it and gave it a meaning. He had a very simple meaning for the word, the, rule, the phrase, the rule of law, which he popularized. He simply said, no man is punishable or can be lawfully made to suffer in body or in goods, except for a distinct breach of the law, and no man is above the law. His definition was as simple as that. But then later, the United Nations enlarged, enlarged the definition and that is what is called the universal now def, universal definition of the rule of law. This is uh, from the, United, the UN. It's, they, they define it as a principle of governance where all persons, institutions and entities, public and private, including the state, are accountable to the law. It's a syst uh, rule of law is a system where laws are publicly promulgated. Equal is, means also equality enforced irrespective of gender, quality enforced irrespective of gender, race, and ethnicity. That is the rule of law we are talking about. Where laws are independently adjudicated and are consistent with the international human rights norms and standards. Sorry, I better move my screen. The principles which define the rule of law include adherence to the principles of supremacy of the law, equality before the law, accountability to the law, fairness in the participation in decision making, legal certainty, avoidance of arbitrariness and transparency and procedural um, uh, procedural and legal. Uh, I think I must have missed something. Now, um, yes. Now, as countries, uh, when COVID-19 pandemic hit um, the world, Kenya included, countries had to adjust to be able to survive, so to speak. And you remember that at the beginning, there, there were emergency measures which included partial or total lockdown. We also went through it in this country. Social distancing, the pandemic is still here, so I believe we are still keeping um, this protocol, social distancing. Some of these things were at the beginning, now they have been eased out. There was a closure of schools, which is normal, offices and other facilities. Schools are open, schools are on, but uh, there is um, the protocols, there are Ministry of Health protocols in this country that I believe in other countries that are being observed. Promotion of vigorous hygiene protocols, including frequent washing of hands. I want to believe that we are still doing this because the pandemic is still here with us as we, we have to, to try and contain it. Declaration of state of uh, emergency, disaster, curfews. We also had curfews here. Some of these things are normal, but they are part and parcel of the history of the pandemic. Closure of ports, we had closure of air, uh, airspace, Deployment of security forces, including the police, we had this, and you know that it did cause quite a bit of a problem, not just here, worldwide. Establishment of COVID-19 response funds. I uh, will not say anything other than that. Now, the question I want to ask now, to pose is, did the emergency measures affect the rule of law in any way? 
because I've gone through several emergency measures. Did they affect the rule of law at all in any way? Unfortunately, my answer is yes, they did, as they resulted in people's access to justice being denied. Yet the need for justice arises every day. The lockdown also resulted in a surge in domestic violence, as you saw, as you watched it, and other forms of violence and economic crisis. There was increased police brutality, not just here in Kenya, we saw in an effort to, um, to make all of us obey curfew at times, especially for those um, who uh, get back a little late, there was increased police brutality, there was especially during curfew hours. The survivors' options were very limited. Protection orders were non-existent at the, as the courts initially were closed. And then slowly the courts opened up. Um, though periodically, like last week, I know that uh, Milimani uh, law courts was being um, fumigated, so it has to be closed, but I think it was just for a day or two. So these emergency measures are still going on in, to, to a certain extent. And that Milimani law courts is what contains, is the building that contains Virtually all the high courts in Nairobi are in Milimani. And the curfew of the, 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 the few survival centers, is, there, are survive, there, there are centers for survival, survivors of especially domestic violence, but they couldn't cope during most of the time last year. They couldn't cope. So um, as countries, battle to contain COVID-19 pandemic and respond to socioeconomic impact of the crisis, they were relying on justice providers to respond to a wide range of justice concerns as they battled to contain COVID-19 pandemic and respond to the socioeconomic impact of the crisis. However, due to economic, um, due to administrative complexity and the slow pace and the high costs associated with state courts around the world, I'm not just talking about here, people realize that in many respects, state courts are not suitable to deal with pressures in a fair and effective way. COVID-19 brought that out very easily, very clearly. So countries turned to customary and statutory, statutory justice providers to fill the gap. So um, it was the time really when alternative dispute resolution mechanisms became very, very important. And uh, very fortunately in this country, as if we knew that COVID-19 would one day come, in this country, Kenya, where we are, our country, we have a constitution, the current constitution. This is the constitution 210. Next time you look at our, you read, you open our constitution 210, please look at article 1592C. You will find that ADR, alternative dispute resolution mechanisms is anchored in our current constitution at this article. It provides among other things that alternative forms of dispute resolution, including uh, conciliation, medi mediation, arbitration, and traditional dispute resolution mechanisms shall be promoted. We have had this law we have had this constitution, very important constitutional provision since 2010. And this is the time now it came in, into play. Fortunately, um, earlier on, the judiciary had, um, had a pilot project on, uh, on mediation since 2015, but arbitration has been going on in this country uh, under an, an act of parliament. So this, th that has been going on since 1995 but mediation was never formalized. 
So it's the current constitution that now formalizes mediation and other forms of dispute resolution mechanisms, including traditional dispute resolution mechanisms. The constitution says this should be promoted. So what is our experience then, the Kenyan experience? Of course, I've talked about the, the mediation, the court annex mediation, which is now a permanent program in the judiciary. And it became um, very handy in a lot of ways, though even that had to be virtual. From about uh, last year, uh, since I think about uh, July, August, September, we started conducting virtual mediations. It wasn't easy, but that was the only way we could, we could get on with it, virtual uh, mediations. But the, it, one could conduct a mediation. I did once with, the, with couples living in California and the lawyers living, one in Kenya, one in Uganda, and I'm here. So it worked. Now, um, whilst the, pandemia, uh, the pandemic was still raging, the, the Chief Justice launched the e-filing system. The courts went virtual, e-filing system. This changed the process of filing court documents, payment of court fees, and the lot. And again, in August last year, 27th of August to be precise, the retired Chief Justice Maraga launched the Alternative Justice Systems Policy, which amongst other things, this policy amongst other things, recognizes alternative justice system as a legitimate system of resolving disputes as provided in the constitution. What remains now, I believe, is just streamlining it, but it has already been launched. Um, we, have, um, we have a policy on customary and traditional justice system we have in this country. Just what remains is, is very little, and I believe that the judiciary hopefully will move towards this and uh, operationalizes, just like it operationalized uh, mediation. Now, what is the way forward? The pandemic is still here. I have already said that the, even the, the, the rule of law was, was affected. So what is the way forward? How do, we continue, how do we move? Now, I want to talk about this organization, IDLO. IDLO is International Development Law Organization. It is the only intergovernmental organization exclusively devoted to promote the rule of law and advance its contribution to peace and sustainable development. IDLO believes that the rule of law is an enabler of justice and inclusion and can, be, can help promote stronger institutions more successful government action and reduce inequalities. So IDLO came up with a policy. This is, uh, th that's why I'm calling it way forward. It came up with a policy last year in September. And the policy which they released it in September is aimed at guiding governments, policy makers, practitioners at national, regional and global level as they formulate the rule of law based responses to COVID-19 pandemic and plan strategies around this, um, around, the, around the policy. As they, it came up with this and hopefully, they are hoping that countries will, will, will adopt it because there has to be a way forward. The pandemic is still here with that and is still in many countries is hurting the rule of law, as I, as I um, gave you the definition. So the policy recommends eight priority actions that countries can take to support and effectively manage the crisis, protect the most vulnerable, and promote a just, inclusive, and sustainable recovery. I'll just show you this. This is directly from IDLO. I haven't added or deducted anything. They recommend first to, that there should be fostering of foster participation, include, involve and empower individuals in decision-making processes. 
these are ways, these are the, the policy has eight ways in which they, you can uh, sustain and maintain the rule of law in this crisis. Ensure the emergency measures are anchored in the rule of law. And you know the rule of law would not allow police, uh, does not allow police brutality. So IDLO says ensure the emergency measures are anchored in the rule of law. Promote fair laws and uh, for recovery. Invest in justice services and expanded legal aid. Foster equitable justice innovation. Engage with alternative dispute resolution and customary and informal justice in line with the international standards. I told you a minute ago also that the policy for customary um, for in customary and informal justice system is in Kenya has already been launched. Was launched by the Chief Justice in all, fact 20th of August last year. So we have it just waiting. I'm sure the judiciary will very soon hopefully operationalize it. So seven, enhance justice for women and girls. You, there was so much about domestic violence during the pandemic and even after the pandemic. So much domestic violence, so much, look at the youth. Is, is that really the, the way, the way that they are banning schools, the way they are behaving? Can that be as a result of the lockdown of almost nine, 10 months? Anyway, uh, promote a renewed spirit of multilateralism in alignment with SDGs, SS. You know that, uh, development goals, sustainable development goals. They are 17 in number and um, aiming at 2010. So as I conclude, I just want to say that, sorry, sorry, it is my hope that the world leaders, as the world leaders discuss joint action to contain and overcome the pandemic, they will consider the need to avoid ensuring harm to the rule of law, principles, and fundamental freedoms. Fellow Rotarians, thank you for your attention. That is all. I will uh, stop sharing my screen and uh, that's it. Thank you so much for that uh, very enlightening <laughs> talk, uh, Rotarian Justice Joyce on the watch and I will now request club members and guests to kindly um, write their questions, if any, in the chat group. Alternatively, uh, they can raise their hands. Uh, Dr. Beatrice. Uh, I see Joanne, Rotir and Joanne has her hand up. Thank you, Justice Alawatch. Thank you so, so, so much. Thank you, Thank you very much. Oh, Dr. Beatrice was on. Can I go next? Okay. Yes. Can I go? May I go? May yes. I continue? So just as all as you know. I would like to thank you very much for... Oh. Um, yes, you may do. Yes. I see. Yes, I see. Uh, yes. Can you mind mute your uh, Zoom, please? Dr. Beatrice, uh, you're on mute. Mm. Right. Um, I'll, I'll request uh, uh, Rutir and Joanne. Yes, I thought I'd let Joanne go first. That's all right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. As you know, just as I'll watch, I'm also a graduate from Fordham University School of Law, 1988. You were the first person I met happened to be a justice uh, when I came to Kenya uh, in 1995 and since then I hit the ground running on biodiversity conserv uh, con uh, conservation. As you know, Madam um, 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 what's continuing in the, in, in the courts now on environment, we are, uh, the conservationists are being hammered. Can mediation help, especially during lockdown? We turn around, KWS has put up, I, I mean, pride, private parties are putting up fences and other uh, manner of contempt of, I mean, 
stop orders are being issued against uh, infrastructure projects, conservationists are getting thrown out of court. Can you give us some help? Can mediation help us get to justice? Yes, mediation is, is much faster, is confidential, is fast. Most mediation sessions would take half a day. And um, I would advocate mediation. If, for example, there are cases pending in court, you can always request, parties can always request that their case be taken, be given to a mediator because the cost has a long list of mediators who are accredited. And, and that is one of the, that's one of the reasons why, um, why I advocate mediation, because it takes a much, much shorter time. It gives people an opportunity to talk and the litigants themselves come up with the help of a mediator, you craft your own resolution that, uh, to the problem, a resolution that you can live with. And that's why there is no appeal. After mediation, there is no appeal. It's that, that decision, uh, you can take it back to court and it will be endorsed as the decision in that dispute. So I would advocate mediation anytime. And there are several mediators uh, will tell you the same thing. We have several mediators in the, in the club. They will tell you the same thing. I would advocate it anytime. And you can see now we are going beyond that into customary and traditional mechanisms of justice. The policy has been launched by the judiciary. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And now we will have Dr. Beatrice followed by Dr. Margareta. Dr. Beatrice? Well, thank you very much uh, for a fantastic presentation. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, yes. Thank you, Justice, Lady Justice Alwatch, for a fantastic presentation. Um, I would like to a simple question regarding the opportunity at this time for the collaborative effort between uh, those who control the rule of law and the healthcare systems. I see it as, a, as an opportunity for us to enhance both systems because uh, the pandemic has brought us uh, to a head on various issues uh, and I think that uh, sometimes uh, because of the crisis of the situation we may lose the opportunity to collaborate to enhance the welfare of the general population. What's your opinion on how it has played out thus far? I think with the pandemic still on, any collaboration is, is 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 welcome isn't it that's what i would see any collaboration is welcome um and it depends on um i, th I think a conversation can be started the two, the two the two sectors almost all sectors if you want a conversation between the justice system and the health system i don't see why they cannot start a conversation just in a way, because now we are moving forward. The pandemic is here. How do we move forward? How do we continue in the new normal? I believe we are in the new normal. How do we continue? If it is possible, I don't see why it should not be possible to collaborate, Se different sectors to collaborate. That's, that's what I would say, yeah. The health sector, the justice sector, because the pandemic has permeated every sector, isn't it? What do you say, Doctor? <laughs> That's what I think, yes. Thank yes. you. Thank you so much. And now we will have a couple more questions. Um, uh, the next question. Mine is a, mine is a simple view on the uh, opportunity to... Yes. Sorry, the next question is going to be from... Uh, Dr. Margareta, followed by Rotarian Nelson and Dr. Manu Chandadia. Dr. Margareta? Yes, thank you. Thank you, President Ritesh. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Justice uh, Joyce. 
it's a privilege to have you speaking to us today, especially in relation to um, the pandemic. I hadn't um, considered that that was, you probably had posted it, but in any case, um, you've talked a great deal about policy, but what I'd like to hear a bit is your own personal experience as um, a mediator in Kenya and what has, um, how it has affected uh, your role and what kind of cases you have had to address in, in these times of pandemic as a mediator. Thank you, Margarita. Uh, during the pandemic, I've had to deal a lot with um, uh, the, the judiciary has sent me, the Kota Next uh, Mediation Registry have sent me child custody cases. There have been mostly family cases because that, that is what has been rampant during the pandemic. I have dealt with a lot of family matters during the pandemic. I have dealt with um, labor and employment uh, matters during the pandemic. And some of the, most of these were actually originating from the court. And the, the good thing is once there is a settlement agreement, it's taken back and it's made the orders in that, in that case. And most of these cases, I haven't, during the pandemic period, I have not done any case that took me more than four or five hours. And that's why it's, it's, it's a faster method, it's confidential, it's private. That's the experience I've had during the uh, pandemic since about, since about August, no, since about July, then a bit of August was a bit of a court vacation, then about um, September, October. Those are the sort of cases that I've dealt with under uh, mediation, under private, one or two private matters that has come to me completely privately not from the courts, no. But at somehow, you, most of them have been to do with family issues. That means there's a lot of turbulence in a lot of families. Have you been able to resolve um, much of that controversy um, and furor? Uh, we hear about domestic violence, especially at these times. Tell us if you've been able to deal um, and resolve those situations. I have not, you know, first of all, domestic violence, they, there's a, a beating involved <laughs> or there's some sort mm -hmm. of violence. So a lot of them fall mm -hmm. under the criminal justice system. And uh, mediation, okay. we haven't been mediating criminal justice matters, but there are areas mm -hmm. where there have been domestic, um, there have been um, disagreements, couples have disagreed, and they at the same time have agreed to, um, to mediation after their disagreements in the family. I have had about three matters of that nature and they were all resolved. Because you, you give people an opportunity to talk. You give the parties an opportunity to talk, whether they are represented or not. With using the mediator skills, you give people an opportunity to talk and rent their anger and, and, and everything and eventually agree. Sometimes they agree to disagree, in, that case, in which case they have the chance to go back to court. Yeah. Wonderful. You're actually, actually a counselor in a sense and almost like um, uh, not a preacher, but someone who listens, um, right? Marvelous. In mediation, in mediation we, call it, we call it active listening. You got to be listening and watching out <laughs> the people's reaction, the party's reaction. How are they reacting? Body language is important. Active listening is important. And we, we find that a lot of people are able to talk through their issues as opposed to sitting. For oh. me, it was quite interesting because I transitioned from making orders, which are done for almost 44 years, and I transitioned into listening and facilitating people's conversation. Yeah. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, Thank you so much. We have uh, a question from Rotarian Nelson, which is in the chat group. I'll read it out, followed by uh, Dr. Manu Chandaria and the past president Arun, and thereafter Dr. Beatrice again. 
So the question from Rotarian Nelson is, we have had a lot of commercial challenges arising from disruption to businesses. A lot of contracts have been uh, uh, repudiated or breached. How can one expedite the process of adjudication via mediation? There are two. Some of this um, is true. There have been a lot of commercial challenges. Some of these cases are already in court. Some are not yet in court. So you are at liberty to pick a mediator because it doesn't have to come from the, from the courts. You can, there are many, many private mediations going on around, around the country, actually. And what I can say is that it will be a much faster method uh, than court litigation. It will restore relationship between you and your business partners because sometimes you still want to continue doing business together. And that is why um, I am advocating mediation. I would not have known that so much can be achieved uh, through mediation until I started uh, handling mediation myself when I got back. That's when I started practicing mediation after I had trained uh, when I was away, yes. Thank you so much. And uh, now we have a question from Dr. Dr. Manu Chandaria. Mm -hmm. Uh, mine is to appreciate uh, Justice. Uh, thank you for coming back after a long absence. Nine years. And, 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 a, and a beautiful necklace you've got. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. All, all, I, all I want to say that with you on the bench, we've got more intelligent, intelligent intelligentsia. Thank you, Manu, but I'm not, strictly speaking, I'm not on the bench anymore because well, I'm not, not sitting as a judge. I'm oh. sitting as, I serve as a mediator now. Oh, you're at mediation? Yes. Well, that's the, that's the fastest route to resolve anything today. It's the fastest route. Fastest, fastest route, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yes. All right, Busy not that bench, maybe the mediation bench. Be, be, there's no, no business transaction that is too big for mediation, no. No, no, other, you know, the time it takes, otherwise the court would just, you know, many, many of the business will go out of the business anyway. That's, so well, thank you, thank you being being there and uh, we look forward. Thank you, thank you, Manu. Coming yeah. from you, thank you, yes. And, and yes. I'm very near your uh, uh, head, I'm just in Geneva. Oh. Yeah. You're in Geneva. Yeah, and so I, I came, I came to, uh, okay. I landed in uh, Amsterdam and then yes. took the flight to here. But I am right home, right here in Nairobi. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> because I, com I completed my nine year term at the, at the Hague, at the ICC. I know that. I know so that. I'm, back home. I'm back home. How is Geneva? Beautiful. Uh, if, I, if I show you the snow, it's wow. Alps is beautiful. Wow, wow. Today the day is beautiful too. Thank you. Keep Thank safe. You. Good luck. Good Wish luck. you well. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Madhubhai. And uh, next we have a question from past president Arun. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, President. Thank you, Justice Oluch. Um, I think the question that Nelson asked you that answered my half question. Uh, yeah. one of the questions, which was that in private sector, you could go to um, mediation without having to go to, through the court, right? That, that, yes. That's understanding. You so can do a mediator, yes. If two parties are not able to agree um, to a compromise or uh, whatever the pain that has been caused, um, how does that work? Um, if, if I'm an aggrieved party uh, and you're on the other side, could, could I just ask your consent to say, look, let's go to an arbitrator and let uh, she decide? That's, that's my number one question. Number two is, in terms of costing, uh, I'm looking at it mainly from the private sector. How does it work? Because you may have a dispute which may, maybe if you were to put monetary terms to it, it might be only a million shillings. But sometimes you have 
where something might have caused your plant to stop or product to be uh, uh, not to the standard because the raw material was wrong and so on. Um, in that respect, how does the costing to both the parties work? Um, to your first question, I want to say that mediation is voluntary. Both parties must agree to mediation. But the difference is this, if the matter had been filed in court, then the judge can make an order that have scrutinized this file, this, this, this matter, and is suitable for mediation. Once a judge makes that order, or a, uh, a senior resident magistrate, I see some files. Once that order is made, then the parties have to go for mediation. Now, whilst you are with a mediator, whether you agree or not, that's a different matter. But once the matter is in court and an order is made, that, that matter must go for mediation. Now, uh, th that's one answer. That's first answer. Now, you are talking about cost. You know, uh, when parties are going for mediation, each party is supposed to provide the mediator with a summary, a summary of, far, of, of what they are claiming and what is agreed between them and what is not agreed. The mediator would normally have the, this list. So I'm assuming that the costs that you are talking about, you would have put them in your summary that because of A, B, C, D, this is what I'm claiming. And this, is, this list is what the two of you are going to be discussing with the assistance of the mediator. So we normally would want your claims in a very, very summary form to enable us to help the parties with the conversation. But otherwise, mediation is voluntary. If, if you um, if you want to um, if you want to have a mediation with a business partner and he says no and you don't have any matter in court or you can go to court and, and seek an order actually that you want to go for mediation because once a court makes an order then this you have to go for mediation. I don't know if I've answered your question. Yes, just, just clarify one more thing please. Yes. <laughs> If I go to the court and the judge says this matter must go to the arbitration, um, is the arbitration's uh, arbitrator's ruling binding um, without recourse to both the parties? That's number one question. Number two, if two of us have voluntarily come for mediation and for some odd reason one party feels no, uh, he does not agree uh, to the ruling which you might have come out with. Is that binding or he could still refuse to bind by it? Good. In your first question, you talked about arbitration. There is arbitration and mediation are completely separate. In the, the major difference is this. In arbitration, an arbitrator First of all, normally uh, business transactions, or there are always an arbitration clause that should should a dispute arise, this we will this matter will will go for arbitration, and in in arbitration, an arbitrator it could be one arbitrator, there could be three arbitrators. They make the decision after listening to you and the other party and the witnesses. They eventually make the decision. This decision should be um, final. It's really supposed to be a final decision, but you still find parties going to court and saying, can you set aside this decision because the, media, the, the arbitrator did this and this, this decision was against public policy, what otherwise an arbitration, a verdict in arbitration should be a final verdict. So that is arbitration. This is completely separate, completely different from mediation. Mediation is conducted by a neutral third party, either chosen to the parties by the court in the registry from the list of accredited mediators that the, that the registry have. If the matter was in court, then the registry, the judge makes the order that this matter should go for mediation. 
and the registry, the relevant registry, then speaks one of the mediators. Now, in mediation, the mediator does not make the decision. This is the major difference between arbitration and mediation. The decision is made by the disputing parties under the guidance of the mediator. That is the major difference. The discussion goes one. First time I've learned the difference between arbitration and mediation. Thank you. Yes, that conversation goes on. The mediator guides you. Sometimes you are both in the same, in, in opening, same session. Sometimes a party wants to talk to the mediator without the other, so we go into private sessions. And this goes on, but you'll be surprised that most business transactions, parties eventually settle because they are able to talk. You're able to talk the way you, you, you can't, you, the court doesn't have that amount of time. You can't spend the whole day talking about one case. The judges have the list that they have to deal with. Mediation gives you a chance to open out, to look at your issues, your interests, your concerns, not just taking one stand. That's why mediation, it takes time, it takes hours, but most mediations do not take days. They end up on that same day. If I just give you an example of a family matter, a succession dispute that had been in the courts for nine and a half years. We started early at nine, well, nine it would be early, 9.15 actually, with a 20 minutes break for lunch. That was still when mediation was face to face, it was not virtual. And come six, the family struck a deal. They had not talked, the matter was in court for nine years. So it's the conversation, people talk, they, you say what it is that you, what is it that is, um, that is making the two of you or three of, what is making this, this business not work? What is it? Why can't you conduct business uh, with this partner or these parties? And you have a chance to talk about it. So, so on and so forth. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, I am aware that uh, Justice on Watch has another uh, engagement at two o'clock. So with that, uh, there are two more questions, but before we go to those questions, uh, I'd like to call upon uh, Vice President Mike, Mike Eldon, to kindly give a vote of thanks. Thank you, Ritesh, and um, thank you, Joyce. The main thing I want to thank you for, you've already been thanked for, by Arun. It's the wonderful necklace you are wearing. <laughs> that <Mike>. aside. <laughs> <laughs> Leaving that aside, um, it's been such a pleasure welcoming you to our Rotary Club in these last few months. Uh, I'm here with Evelyn, of course. Ah, Evelyn and Mark, Mike were my sponsors to the club. They introduced me to the club. Thank you, both of you. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. So other, yes. other than thanking you for um, being a club member, um, my job today is to, to thank you for this wonderful talk you've given and what you've shown us, Joyce, is that um, you are such a, a clear, logical, structured thinker as you've guided us in the simplest of non-legal language through this uh, topic, um, which is so uh, dear to you and so dear to the rotary spirit of um, mediation, of bringing people together rather than this uh, traditional adversarial approach to resolving legal issues. Um, and um, the fact that you, among the many places to which you are affiliated, one is this mediators beyond borders is so you, because um, you are a universal person, whether it's in The Hague or around Africa or working um, with India or elsewhere. Um, mediator without border is Joyce Olwatch. Thank you. As you talked, uh, so many things I'm sure were going through many of our minds about our situation here in Kenya. And what came to my mind was a cartoon I came across again yesterday from early November in The Nation, mm. which is Uhuru coming down 
from the mountain with two tablets. One was a very small one, which was the laws for top politicians. And the other one is a very huge tablet with lots and lots of laws for the rest of us. And in connection, particularly with this COVID, we have been seeing these huge rallies with tightly packed and unmasked participants and the politicians just being um, immune to what they're preaching to the rest of us. That was such a sad expression of preaching water and drinking wine. The um, legal profession also is not the best of role models as we're seeing with all the fracas in the law society of Kenya that you and I have talked about in the past and it seems yeah. to be getting worse, doesn't it? So where yeah. is the rule of law among the, the, uh, the law society's um, participants? We also worry about how the selection of the next chief justice will work. But the area that is trying to promote uh, cohesion, social cohesion at this time and the rule of law in Kenya is the National Cohesion and Integration Commission. Yes. And, and I don't know if you, I think you were with us, weren't you, when we invited Sam Kobia, the chairman of NCIC, yes. to speak. And since yes. spoken to him uh, again about bringing you into that national dialogue to bring people together when the politicians are pulling us apart as they think the election is tomorrow morning. So there's plenty of work for you to do, not only on this one-on-one -on -one micro mediation, mm -hmm. but on using your extraordinary talents at the national level. And we look forward to this partnership between NCIC and Rotary, not just our club, but Rotary nationally, mm -hmm. so that we can make a contribution as Rotarians as mediators who live by the four-way test. Mm -hmm. So Joyce, many thanks for giving us this talk today. I'm sure from time to time we'll ask you to give us more talks as you reflect on other aspects of the precious work that you do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. I'll, I hope that I'll be, um, I'll be able to work uh, in some way or other so that uh, I can help to bring people together because we are, we are approaching a very dangerous situation from what I can see. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry, hi. I am running to Langata uh, Cemetery because a friend of mine is uh, going to be buried. I couldn't go to church, but I promised that I would meet them at the cemetery.